a.m. Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a Japanese fleet of six aircraft carriers sits 230 miles north of Hawaii. 350 pilots say their prayers before embarking on their mission to bomb Pearl Harbor. Among the airmen on the carrier Hear You is 19-year-old Taisuke Maruyama. Around December 1941, I was a member of the squadron on the carrier Hiryu. I was a second-ranked pilot then, but I didn't have a clear idea of what was going to happen in the future. Maruyama's training had included the rigid Japanese indoctrination of the military spirit. All cadets were taught to obey their leaders and be willing to freely give their lives for Japan. So our job was simple. It was to fight whenever they wanted us to fight. The Japanese trained their pilots well. Planning the attack on Hawaii took almost a year. For months, they practiced low-altitude torpedo runs to attack battleships and high-altitude precision bomb drops to destroy their main target, the United States aircraft carriers. Our goal is to sink the aircraft carriers, but if they aren't there, I'm going to sink a battleship. From the United States' point of view, Pearl Harbor's geographical structure made it a perfect base for their Pacific fleet. The narrow entrance and shallow waters of the harbor made it nearly impenetrable. Ford Island, on which the naval station is based and the American ships are anchored, is well protected. To the leaders of the American Navy, a full-scale attack by an enemy naval force was impossible. But the Japanese were rehearsing an air attack, and thanks to a geographical coincidence, they could practice with precision. Japan's Kamioke Bay is the twin sister of Pearl Harbor. At Kamoike base in Kagashima, I did a lot of bombing training in a Type 97 bomber. Kagashima Bay has a structure that is very similar to Pearl Harbor. So I got a lot of training going from Kagashima Bay to Sakura Island, flying low and then attacking. 5.15 a.m. The pilots are given their final orders. Chief of the Navy, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, tells them that they are now responsible for the glory of the empire. The Japanese armada is now 220 miles north of Hawaii, safely out of range of American radar detection. 5.30 a.m., the first wave of airmen prepares for takeoff in their fighter planes and torpedo bombers. This assemblage comprises a strike force of over 180 aircraft. Meanwhile, 200 miles south of Oahu, the United States aircraft carrier Enterprise is launching 18 aircraft. They're headed for Ford Island in the center of Pearl Harbor. Estimated time of arrival, 8 o'clock. 6.10 a.m., 183 Japanese fighters, dive bombers, and high-altitude bombers are launched from carriers with split-second timing. All planes are in the air within 15 minutes. Their plan is to attack in three waves. The first would assault all military installations across the entire island of Oahu. The second would zero in on more specific targets. The third would take off fuel storage tanks, dry docks, and repair facilities. As morning breaks in Honolulu, overnight clouds disappear. It's another beautiful day in paradise, and work as usual for Henry Thettinger. My father was a painting contractor, and we had a job right outside the main gate of Pearl Harbor called the Makalapa Housing Project. So, December 7th, some new pickup trucks came in over the weekend, so my father asked me if I'd go out and stencil the two job numbers on side of the doors of the pickup trucks, and I said, yes, I would. We lived uh, maybe about a 25-minute drive to, down to Pearl from Waikiki. And it was a regular Sunday morning and hardly any traffic on the road whatsoever. 7.02 a.m. While Henry drives to the harbor, two army privates at a radar station on the North Shore pick up what appears to be a flight of unidentified aircraft 132 miles north of Oahu. They report the information to Fort Shafter, but the only person there is a new lieutenant who had just started training four days earlier. 7.20 a.m. The Japanese fleet, now 210 miles from Oahu, have launched a second wave, 268 assault aircraft. 
the inexperienced lieutenant at Fort Shafter feels certain that the unidentified planes are B-17s scheduled to arrive from the mainland at 8 a.m. He instructs the radar station to shut down. I got there about, I would say, uh, about 7.30. When you went through the gates of playing those military bases, you were checked pretty thoroughly. 7.25 a.m., an early morning church service is being held at the Kaneohe Naval Base. Turret gunner Leon Kolb is getting ready for his day on the USS Oklahoma. I'd been out to have my meals with the rest of the division and back in the gun turret and getting ready for the daily Sunday routine, in-port routine in the gun turret. I was uh, rated a gunner's mate, second class petty officer, and I was stationed in a forward 14-inch gun turret. The Oklahoma was one of the finest battleships in the American fleet. But a day earlier, she was moved from her customary defensive mooring on Battleship Row. Normally, my ship would have been back where the battleship Nevada and Arizona was. We belonged to that division. But the admiral aboard the Maryland was going to inspect our ship on the following Monday morning for readiness for war. To do that, we had a, all of the so-called double bottomings and storerooms and so forth opened up to air out so it was more comfortable for the inspecting officers to go through and see the condition of the ship. Opening the exterior portholes and interior hatches for fresh air made sense on December 6th, but on December 7th, 1941, it would leave the battleship dangerously vulnerable. 7.35 a.m. Japanese reconnaissance planes radio back to the Armada that the main American fleet is in Pearl Harbor. Approaching the island of Oahu from its mountainous eastern coast, the first wave of Japanese squadrons are not detected by radar. There is a dead zone caused by the mountains. Plus, American surveillance planes are not in the air on Sunday mornings. This facilitates the element of surprise. Admiral Yamamoto realizes he must eliminate the American naval strength in the Pacific if Japan is to be victorious. The Japanese believe that the American public will be discouraged by heavy losses and stay out of the war. December the 7th, like any other Sunday morning, mom in the kitchen making breakfast. On this morning, six-year-old Dorinda Makanoa Nalani is at home with her family. In 1941, she is one of just a few thousand Americans living in the Kingdom of Hawaii. The islands are not a state but a territory of the U.S. They would not become one of the United States until 1959, 18 years later. We were about the only civilians that could actually be in the harbor and watch the battleships and the planes come and go. Little did we realize that Pearl Harbor would change from being a place to being an event. 7.52 a.m., Commander Mitsuo Fushida, who leads the Japanese air attack, radios back the code, Tora, 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 meaning success, maximum strategic surprise, Americans caught unaware. At 7.55 a.m., the island-wide attack begins. The first wave of Japanese forces attack at points all around the island of Oahu, not just Pearl Harbor. Dive bombers strike at Kaneohe Naval Air Station, while dive bombers and fighters attack Bellows Field. Being a squadron communications officer, I was assigned to the 86th Observation Squadron Bellows Field on the windward side of the island on December the 7th, in the morning about 7.30. Those of us who were in the BOQ, Bachelor Officers' Quarters, up on the top of the hill above the airstrip, we were all awakened by a crash landing, a B-17, at the end of our runway. And the crew was semi-hysterical, saying that they were attacked. And while we were talking to the crew, a flight of Japanese planes came in and strafed. They were so low, you could see the faces of the pilots. During that attack, 
every man for himself was scattered. I remember I jumped under the shack of the operation shed. Seven fifty-eight a.m. Horizontal bombers arrive at Pearl Harbor. No one even suspects they're Japanese. Before the war started, our own aircraft used to make mock raids and their uh, maneuvers on Pearl Harbor. They'd fly over and they'd start to dive down and they make their maneuvers, uh, torpedo planes or, or uh, dive bombers, whatever they were at that time. And uh, so we kind of got used to that because uh, the fact they were making probably the maneuvers maybe every two or three times a month. And I heard the airplanes. And I saw him start to dive, so I went back to work, and then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Waves of bombers continue to pound military installations in an all-out assault on the island. But the Japanese aren't limited to military sites. They're also bombing civilian targets. Hearing the roar of airplanes, airplane after airplane going over, didn't seem unusual. After all, we lived in a military installation, and yet there was something different because the explosions by this time were shaking our house. Anyone who can grabs a gun and fights back. There is massive confusion as Americans try to grasp what is happening. tragic case of bad timing, the scheduled American B-17s and the U.S. aircraft from the Enterprise arrive Pearl Harbor at the same time and are caught between enemy and friendly fire. 8.05 a.m., machine guns on battleship Nevada open fire on torpedo planes. Repair ship Vestal moored next to Arizona opens fire. Battleship California receives torpedo portside at frame 1110. High-level bombers begin the run on Battleship Row. One of the easiest targets is the defenseless Oklahoma. On board, the only thing Leon Kolb is expecting is sabotage. When the first torpedoes hit my ship on December the 7th, I thought, that's what's happened. After the second or third explosion, the officer of the deck came on our communication system and said, all hands man your battle stations. The enemy's attacking. And it went through my mind, who's the enemy? Amidst the frenzy, American soldiers are still unsure who exactly is attacking them. One of the fellows said, the whole enemy fleet's right off a of diamond head. I had to go outside and look for myself because I counted five and six more explosions and I thought, what's hitting us? I did not realize it was Japanese airplanes until I saw what they call the meatball there in Sydney. So I stood out there for a while and watched the rain. Believe me, those boys could fly the planes. They come in on their torpedo run or their bombing run and turn those things up on its tail and come back to strafe. So they were darn good pilots. The first wave of the Japanese attack on the island of Oahu is a stunning victory for the enemy. America's Pacific fleet feels the sting of newly perfected torpedoes designed specifically for the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Violent explosions rock light cruisers, mine layers, and battleships like the Oklahoma. But this is only the beginning. The second wave of the Japanese attack is about to begin. At 7.55 a.m. on Sunday, December 7, 1941, the Japanese begin their strategic surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and the island of Oahu. Every military target is being hit. Americans put up whatever resistance possible, but it is no match for the onslaught. 8.08 a.m. Local radio station KGMB interrupts music to call all military personnel to duty. High-level Japanese bombers are unleashing armor-piercing delayed action bombs from 10,000 feet. One scores a direct hit on the battleship Arizona. 
The mighty warship sinks in less than nine minutes. I looked up and I saw the high altitude bombers come along. I did see the Arizona blow up and the smoke and flames must have gone five, six hundred feet in the air. I mean, it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Somebody asked me if I was scared. I said, you darn right I was scared. You know, who, who wouldn't be? Two ship lengths away, the USS Oklahoma is an easy target. I thought, this is going to be the closest I'll ever come to death without losing my life. I wanted to go back down to my locker and take the things out I had, seeing I was going to have to leave the ship. One of them was an engagement ring that I just bought for my wife. It was a full carrot, but something told me to save my life. The Oklahoma is hit by 10 torpedoes. Explosions have ripped holes throughout the ship's armor. And because portholes and watertight hatches had been left open overnight, seawater is surging into the ship. There's no portholes in there so you can look out and see what's going on. But you sense that the ship's going way out of balance. By that time, others had start going over the side. So I assumed they'd heard the word to abandon the ship. And I was one of the first two or three to swim to an officer's boat. Dive bombers come over. I actually watched the, followed the plane in until it dropped the bomb on the Pennsylvania, which was in the dry dock. 8.14 a.m., the Oklahoma has capsized. Turret gunner Leon Kolb has barely escaped with his life. But hundreds of men trapped inside the Oklahoma's hull can be heard pounding against the steel. High above the blazing wreckage, 19-year-old Japanese airman Taisuke Maruyama witnesses the destruction of the bomb he dropped. The bomb my plane dropped hit the battleship Oklahoma. Since it was my first mission, I was happy that my bomb did hit the Oklahoma and we won the battle. Desperate attempts to free the men trapped inside the overturned Oklahoma will continue on into the night. 8.15 a.m., KGMB interrupts regular programming for a second call, ordering all military personnel to report for duty, including doctors and nurses. I was stationed at Triple General Hospital. I was assigned to the maternity ward. And, of course, we had a lot of uh, enlisted men with their families there. But coming from Pennsylvania, of course, I hadn't seen all this tropical paradise like that was. The amount of military uh, that was there was really overwhelming. But, you know, we were completely removed from any thought of any war. I don't think most of us e even realized there was a crisis there. I was in bed, sound asleep. Two of our night nurses tried to get us all awake, and we thought they were joking. We thought, oh, this is, come on now, this is, you're kidding. <laughs> Can't be. We had three casualties, two pilots, and one attempted to take off in the bravest act I've ever seen while under fire, stepping into his plane, was strafed and fell over like a movie scene. And another pilot did get his plane into the air. He was shot down. At 8.26 a.m., the Honolulu Fire Department responds to a call from Hickam Field. Of the brave, unarmed men who are trying to save lives, three firemen are killed and six are wounded. We didn't have guns up to that time. They opened the armament shack, and there was no loose ammunition for the rifles. So we took bandoliers and machine gun shells. We were laden down with the arms. 8.50 a.m., the second wave of Japanese aircraft come in from the north. Their plan of attack is to once again strike military bases all across the island with fighters, horizontal bombers, and dive bombers. Three of us were ascending the stairs from our barracks up to the hospital, which was up on a knoll. We could look over to the left and see Pearl Harbor and the tremendous explosions. And a plane came flying very, very low over us and it was a Japanese pilot, and he looked out and he smiled to us and he waved to us. And we all three waved back, stood there and waved back. 
8.54 a.m., the second attack run begins. 78 dive bombers hit ships in Pearl Harbor. 54 high-level bombers hit naval air stations. 36 fighters circle over the harbor to maintain air control. When we arrived on duty, they were bringing them in. The ambulances were lined up outside with patients from all over, you know. Some of them uh, were a few civilians that they'd picked up off the streets, and but most of them were uh, Hick and Field. I was assigned to three beds, and my first three patients that came in expired without being able to do anything for them. The first wave of the Japanese attack caused immediate confusion. But now, the second wave creates total chaos. Americans fire at anything in the sky. Tragically, some of the planes shot down were the unarmed United States B-17s from the mainland and the planes sent by the U.S. carriers. We had deaths, a lot of deaths. Went way beyond our normal capacity. I'm the attack from 755. I probably stayed there maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Then I uh, got in the car and drove back to Waikiki Beach. And things was in such chaos that the sentry just stick a rifle in your window, you know, wonder where you're going. And it was such a chaos. 9.05 a.m. Radios around the island issue urgent warnings for citizens to get off the roads and stay at home. But not everyone hears the call. Dad ran out the front door, screen door slamming behind him, me down the steps, and we ran down to the front of the house, looked up, and plane after plane going over. There was strafing uh, up and down the street, and the bullets that found our house were incendiary bullets. The Japanese attack ignites a fire that would destroy Dorinda's childhood home. My dad knew that we needed to get away, so he headed out away from the harbor. He drove along the edge of the harbor and uh, along the side that would be where the Oklahoma had turned on its side and could literally look right at Battleship Row. In the harbor, rescuers disregard the second wave of attack and start to work on the capsized Oklahoma. Their plan is to cut through the hull, which is solid steel and two feet thick. We had absolutely no information and we didn't know what to do. The Japanese plan is working to perfection. Every attack not only meets but exceeds their expectations. Military installations across the entire island of Oahu are in flames civilians are running for their lives and American military personnel can only react. There is no organized plan of action. There was a lot of confusion. The emergency rooms were filled to capacity. Everybody worked to their best ability, I'm sure. Lots of burns, lots of severe, severe burn cases. 10 a.m. The first wave of Japanese aircraft returned to their carriers, which are now just 190 miles off the coast of Oahu. Only 29 planes are lost. A stunning victory. Everyone felt that uh, they definitely would be coming back because our defenses were so completely down. 11.46 a.m. Reports come in that Japanese troops are landing on the island of Oahu. We'd been speculating during the day but will they come in with parachute troops and take over it looks like they very well could because we had several fuel oil storage tanks for the ships so that looked like they had intentions on coming back we lived in fear of an invasion we were told over and over and over that the Japanese were coming back Hawaii's population is now living in fear of a Japanese invasion. The Japanese army is known for its ruthless cruelty in occupied nations. Now, just four hours into the attack, the island is on fire. The skies are filled with suffocating black smoke. Communication is cut off from the mainland with absolutely no hope of help. The people of Hawaii are certain that there will be a Japanese invasion. The only question is, when? On the morning of December 7th, 1941, Japanese forces launched a surprise attack on the island of Oahu. 
The attack struck every military installation on the island and the majority of the American Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. A Japanese high-altitude bomber scored a direct hit on the Arizona, killing 1,177 men. Over 10 torpedoes struck the Oklahoma, capsizing her in the harbor, trapping over 400 men inside. Following orders on board the Oklahoma, gunners made Leon Kolb abandon ship, but he is driven to fight back. Everyone wanted revenge. I uh, figured if we could get over to Ford Island, that's where all the planes were, what planes were in. We might have a chance to salvage some machine guns and shoot back if this thing keeps going on. 12.10 p.m. Americans managed to get a few planes airborne and fly north in search of the Japanese aircraft carriers. Back on the island, people are in a state of shock. We never dreamed that they'd hit us, hit our strongest base where the most of our fleet was. I don't think that the officers in charge ever thought that the Japanese would take a chance with their fleet to come in that close. Following the attack, the people of Oahu wait and worry. The American military has been immobilized. There is no chance of defending Hawaii against a full-scale invasion. An invasion seems inevitable. We were advised later in the day that the Japanese were landing at Pearl Harbor with ground troops. Fear of an enemy invasion gives way to paranoia. 12.30 p.m., Honolulu police raid the Japanese embassy. Animosity has turned towards the Japanese living on the island. Don Seki experiences it firsthand. Saturday night, December 6th, we were playing poker all night long. And uh, nobody got ahead, so we want to quit. So we start shooting crap. <laughs> I live in a valley called Manoa Valley. Now and then, we see target practice. They're pulling target in the airplane. We thought it was, you know, target practice. After the bombing, here comes a guy. He says, uh, you bombed Pearl Harbor. So he pulled a knife on us. So we scrambled, went home. Then we listened to the radio. Then we found out it was bombed. Government agents go into action, seizing radios from Japanese, fearing they would broadcast messages and information to their native land. At 1 p.m., the Japanese air commander Fushida lands safely on board the aircraft carrier Akagi. With the amazing success of the first two waves, he is ready to launch the third. We knew there were planes, but we didn't realize that they didn't bring ground forces. And they, had they anticipated the success their Air Force had, they would have followed up with ground forces because Hawaii was vulnerable. Hawaii was more than vulnerable. It was an utter chaos. On board the Japanese aircraft carrier, Commander Fushida pushes hard for the launch of the third wave. But at 1.30 p.m., Admiral Nagumo decides to call off the attack. The Japanese fleet withdraws. One torpedo could have knocked the dry dock out and withheld repairing a lot of the battleships that was damaged. If they had torpedoed the dry dock gate, that would have been more damage almost than what they did to the battleships. Reportedly, the Admiral called off the third wave because he was unsure of the location of the American aircraft carriers. The Japanese had scored a tremendous victory with the first two attacks. Now there was no need to risk defeat with a third. At 4.25 that afternoon, the Hawaiian governor proclaims martial law. The military now controls the island. For the Japanese Americans, it is suddenly dangerous to be identified with the country of their birth. We were very much under surveillance. And uh, some people, were, they threw their, all their photographs and literature and stuff and they burned it and so because of, in case of the FBI, you know. Paranoia engulfs the island. No one knows that the enemy fleet is already heading back to Japan. Everyone is still poised for the invasion. They're sure is coming. When I was uh, sleeping on the floor of a uh, barracks on Fort Island, all the guns that could still fire opened up in the harbor. So the most of us thought, like me, I guess, but well, here they come. It turned out that was a couple of the airplanes from the carrier that was supposed to be in that they'd sent in to see what's going on. The poor guys got shot down. 
They made me feel pretty bad. A total of seven American planes would be shot down by friendly fire. Homes and private property are destroyed by U.S. anti-aircraft shells. America is now at war, a war she is not prepared to fight. And for Stephen Weiner, it would mean coming face to face with the enemy. At about 10 o'clock at night, we're sitting talking and we see two figures approaching us from the shoreline. One was a National Guard corporal and he was leading an Oriental. And the Oriental was nude with the exception of a loincloth. And so he turned him over to us. So we took him to the operation check. He had been in the water for many hours. His skin was all wrinkled. And we put a blanket around him. And we gave him a hard boiled egg and a shot of booze. And then we started to interrogate him, holding the 45 at his temple. Through the night, Second Lieutenant Steve Weiner will interrogate the first Japanese prisoner of war. If Hawaii is to prepare for the onslaught to come, information will have to be forced out of the prisoner by any means necessary. The night following the Japanese attack, Hawaii is on edge. U.S. bombers from the mainland are mistakenly shot down, and Oahu has erupted in chaos. Meanwhile, Steve Weiner continues interrogating the first Japanese prisoner of war with little luck. He was a defiant little guy. We didn't seem to have him buffaloed at all. I would say after maybe two hours, he said, uh, paper, pencil. So we gave him a manila envelope that was on the desk and a pencil. And he wrote, I am Japanese naval officer. He wrote this in English. My ship catch in coral. I jump into water, swim to this airplane land, kill me in honorable way, no tell about ships, and he signed his name, Sakamaki. We kept him, I think, until about five or six in the morning, where G2 from Fort Shafter uh, sent over for him. We gave him the document that he had signed and turned the supposed prisoner over to them. Then on the morning of December 8th, Lieutenant Weiner makes an unusual discovery. We saw a coning tower sticking out on the surf. It was only about a half a mile out, not even that far. There were five midget subs involved in a special operation. Sakamak was to sink the Pennsylvania. His failure was because his steering gear fouled when he was released, and he drifted. He and his enlisted men attempted to swim in at night, and the body of his enlisted men washed in the next morning. 11 a.m., Monday, December 8th. Wreckage litters runways on airstrips around the island. Pearl Harbor is smoldering. While casualties mount from the attack, rescue workers continue fighting to save the 461 men still trapped inside the overturned hull of the Oklahoma. I can still see the bottom of my ship that was left up out of the water and wondering how many were still down in there. I, I heard that they cut holes in and brought some out. I didn't know who or how many. Following several different rescue attempts, only 32 of the trapped sailors were saved. 429 men lost their lives. From the wreckage of the island, the overnight distrust of the local Japanese descended into outright racism. In Hawaii, 50% Japanese were the majority. My uh, folks they came in in 1906 as an immigrant, and we were laborers in a sugar plantation. Almost immediately, Japanese Americans were rounded up by U.S. military and placed in internment camps. You know, we we're angry because we broke up our lifestyle, you know. Everybody's friendly, no racial problem there. Hmm? Filipinos, Chinese, Koreans, so forth. There were about 800 persons went to the camp, internment camp from Hawaii. There were like ministers and school teachers and group organizers, so forth. Everything got to hell, you know. They lost everything, big money. As the Japanese on the island were sent to internment camps, 
new hardships for the rest of the islanders were just beginning almost immediately was hawaii went under martial law there's such huge changes bomb shelters had to be constructed everywhere sandbags in front of lots of our downtown office buildings plate glass windows were all taped they did trenches at a lot of schools that you'd just jump into we used to have practice if there would be a bombing where you would go where the shelters all were I thought the gas masks were kind of novel and fun until you got tired of carrying them. In fact, there were rumors that the Japanese would do this as a germ warfare and they would put gases into the air. After the war started, we had to wear a gas mask. We had a complete blackout, too. We had all our curtains were blacked out. We couldn't show a little sliver of light coming through a curtain. Our headlights on our cars were blacked out with a little slit which is white with a little shield over it. We had uh, alerts too, we had old sirens go off, we'd have to run out, put our gas mask on and all that sort of stuff. When you live in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, isolated by all those miles and miles of ocean, you rely on ships to bring you everything. And now these are enemy waters, and they're going to be bringing troops. They aren't going to be thinking about bringing supplies. The part I remember the most is doing without toilet paper. You know, taking newspaper and then trying to rub it and rub it and rub it to see if it, you could get it soft enough. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor and the entire island of Oahu, Americans are not demoralized. They accept the situation that was forced upon them. It was now time for war. Their enemy, the Japanese. And now, a gargantuan sense of defiance lifts their desires for one united goal. Payback for the surprise attack. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, American forces in Hawaii were critically unprepared for an enemy assault. In fact, commanders were mainly concerned with sabotage. Before the Japanese attack, Fighters and bombers at airfields around Oahu were taken out of defensive positions and lined up out in the open, wingtip to wingtip. A difficult target for subversives, but easy prey for enemy planes. A battleship was moved from its strategic position to make it more accessible for inspection. Radar was a relatively new device. Many of the young officers were still training on the equipment. Japanese military planners knew that there is a dead zone created by the mountains and that American surveillance planes are not in the air on Sunday mornings. The Japanese military spent over a year planning their attack on Pearl Harbor. They knew exactly where the American airfields were and how many planes were there. They knew the location of the battleships, cruisers and destroyers. The Japanese attack was unprovoked and undeclared and at first, devastating. The enemy had all the advantages, including the element of surprise. The toll on American forces was just short of catastrophic. 2,388 were killed, 1,178 wounded. A direct hit on the Arizona claimed the lives of over 1,100 men. The Oklahoma was torpedoed over 10 times and over 400 sailors perished. In total, of the 96 ships in Pearl Harbor during the attack, 19 were sunk or severely damaged. The Navy had 92 of their aircraft destroyed and 31 damaged. The Army had 96 aircraft destroyed and 128 damaged. The Japanese lost only 29 planes. But that's where the Japanese victories end. Following their first two attack waves, the Japanese command decides not to launch its third, an attack that was designed to destroy fuel storage, repair fields, and dry docks. The Japanese admiral called off the second attack, not knowing where the carriers were. 
That decision became a catalyst for American forces to quickly repair sunk and damaged vessels. 24-hour work shifts set the military and civilians to rebuilding the Pacific Fleet. Of the 19 ships that were sunk or heavily damaged, 14 ships were completely restored and went on to fight the enemy. After the attack, I went almost immediately out on a destroyer starting to attack Marshall Islands and showing the Japanese that they really didn't sink all of our fleet and so forth. I ended up spending a little over 10 years in the Navy. If Pearl Harbor hadn't been attacked and we hadn't gotten into war, that would have been the end of my naval career there. Patriotism was the foundation for the American comeback, and the Japanese Americans of Hawaii proved themselves in battle. We, as a Japanese American, although we're segregated, I decided to volunteer for the Army. We trained for one year, then went overseas. Hawaii's original recruitment quota was set at 1,500 men. Over 10,000 volunteered. Our motto was go for broke. Let me shoot the works. We had to do good because we're under the guns and uh, we are going to do good. As the segregated unit of the 100th Battalion Regimental Combat Team, they fought on the European front. In eight campaigns, we had eight unit citation and about 21 medal honor. We fought really hard. For their size and length of service, they became the most decorated soldiers in the U.S. Army, with 18,413 individual awards and 9,000 Purple Hearts. Don Secchi received a Purple Heart for the loss of his arm during battle in Italy. He returned home a hero. For the Japanese, the definition of hero is rigid. In a wartime painting honoring nine of the ten mini-sub officers at Pearl Harbor, Kazuo Sakamaki, the first Japanese prisoner of war, is noticeably missing. That document that he had written, Kill Me in an Honorable Way, was lost. And the Japanese people considered him persona non grata in Japan. Ensign Sakamaki was in South America working for Toyota Motors, and it was deliberate shipping him out of the country. Lieutenant Stephen Weiner met his prisoner once more at the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. After 50 years, they had the chance to relive their encounter. In fact, I told him that I admired his tenacity, the fact that he was able to cope with us as well as he did. Japanese airman Taisuke Maruyama, on the other hand, was heralded a hero. Following his successful bombing of the Oklahoma, he went on to fight at Midway and Okinawa. Through her love of Pearl Harbor, Dorinda Nicholson wrote a book about her childhood recollections so that future generations of children will understand what it's like to live through war. The harbor is very special to me. And uh, I approached the Arizona Memorial and uh, mentioned to them that I wanted to tell American children the story. Hawaii has not forgotten Pearl Harbor. A memorial now stands over the site of the sunken USS Arizona. Every year, one and a half million visitors come from around the world to pay tribute. Not far from the memorial is the USS Missouri, where the Japanese signed their surrender. It stands as a monument to the bravery and selflessness of those who were there that day in Pearl Harbor.